This is episode 66. I am so happy that you're here and thank you for joining my show, your coach, Helen Yuskovic. I am on a worldwide mission to help people get confident in putting themselves first because I used to put myself second my whole life. And because of that, I experienced every unhealthy relationship possible. An unhealthy relationship with myself, my health, my wealth, my intimate relationships, my family, my friends, and my career. I'm now living in an abundance that I used to just dream about. So I want to pave the way for you too. It's time, guys. It's time that you live in the life of your dreams as well. So let's take a step towards that right now. P.S. Subscribe to my podcast on your app now so that you always tune in to my new episodes. Welcome back to the show. I have someone super cool here today and her name is Nicolina. And let me just tell you a little bit of amazing stuff about Nicolina. She is a writer of Nine's Essential Baby and Essential Kids. Nicolina is also a new mum, congratulations, (laughs) or as she calls it, a permanent slave to Noah. (laughs) And at times she adores her new job. And at times, the majority of the time, her patience runs as thin as the dental floss that she hasn't used in months. Yep, that's right. She doesn't use dental floss in months <laughs> outside of her 24-7 slavery. Nicolina is a media whiz. She hosts the How To Life podcast at Nova Entertainment and is also a travel writer and guest presenter on Getaway. Alongside this, she is also a regular guest on Nine's Today Show and Ticker News. This woman does so many things and I didn't meet her doing any of that. (laughs) I met her at a gym called F45. So Nicolina, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. This is so exciting. I feel like that's a lot of things that you listed there, but I have no idea how I even function with those things because the majority of the time, as you explained, I am a mum and I I don't have like five minutes to myself, but I somehow have managed to make it work. (laughs) Isn't it interesting, Nikki, when someone reads everything that you've done and you're like, whoa, when yeah. was the last time you patted your own back and like congratulated yourself on all your accolades? Oh, we don't do it often enough, 100%. And we, every time I think that we achieve an achievement or we reach something that we've wanted for so long, we finally accomplish it, it's always on to the next thing. I feel like we'd never just stop and think, wow, amazing, congratulations, celebrate sit in the moment for a little bit. We just never do that. It's always on to the next thing. So, yeah, it is nice. But I think like a really practical way you could do that is maybe just write a biography for yourself and see what you've done and written it out, write it out as if you're on this show and Helen's introducing you and you can actually see what you've achieved. So, yeah, it's so true. I used to do acting and emceeing and DJing and Back then, I used to dream about things. Like, I wish that I could, you know, play around Australia. I wish I could be on that TV show. I wish I could go to Hollywood. And then when I did accomplish a lot of those things, I never realised that I was accomplishing the dream until now, like nearly eight years later, when I'm out of that industry, I was like, I did do some of those things. I did tick the boxes, yeah. (sighs) (laughs) thinking about that your one of your biggest achievements is giving birth (laughs) that's huge it is quite an achievement to be honest and it's one of those things that again you just like I completely forget that I've given birth to a human which is an amazing thing it's an amazing accomplishment And you, yeah, you just forget about it. You forget about the experience, whether positive or negative. And this is why so many people have more kids because you just forget about the pain. You forget about how intense it was. And then you're like, oh, I want to have another one. Realize you have to give birth again. And it's just a cycle, Helen. I'm already in that cycle of when am I going to have my second baby? Even though if you asked me a week after giving birth, I would have told you this is an only child and he will not be getting any siblings. I'll give you a little bit of uh, positive feedback. My best friend with her second child was only two pushes and done. (gasps) No. See, I hate, I 
I'm sure she's a great lady, but I hate hearing stories like that. You know, it's like, why you? Why was I not chosen to be blessed with that beautiful experience? <laughs> No, yeah, that one was easy. The first one was a little bit difficult. Nikki, can you tell me, how did you get to where you are today? Like, what was, like, your journey? Can you just run us through, like, a little bit, a snapshot, if you will, of your life and how you've managed to do all of this wonderfulness? Do you know, sometimes I think about my life and it's very regular. I feel like I'm just a normal, regular person. But I think, as with everyone, everyone has, like, a little bit of, sprinkle of amazingness throughout their life that they've achieved specific things or something that's really interesting about you that somebody would think wow tell me that story and I feel like I've got my fair share of those but I do live a pretty regular life but in terms of how I've gotten to this point well I'm 28 and um you know still still trying to kick goals still still going and I'd probably say I'm quite young for a lot of the things that I have achieved which is a really nice thing to say I had a pretty like a pretty regular 20s but some exciting achievements in them so obviously I um, went to school and then straight into school I knew that I wanted to do something to do with media I just have always been um, very talkative nobody could shut me up my dad always said, oh, you just want to be a star. You just want to be in front of the camera. I just was always had that personality. So when I went to university, I really, really wanted to get into media. Didn't actually get into my media degree. So I just found a way to get there and started with commerce and then added my media degree into it. Yeah, I started with a business degree, which was that just was never going to happen. No, it just is not in me, numbers. Um, but while I was at university, that's when the first biggest change of my career happened is um, I won a radio competition. It was called The Edge Star, which sounds very lame. But, <laughs> yeah, it was called the, the Edge Star, and it was run by The Edge, which is a radio station in Sydney. And um, they were just looking for an on-air announcer. I happened to apply. Couldn't believe it. They called me and said, you're in the top 10. Couldn't believe it. They said, you're in the top three. Couldn't believe it. Got into the top two. And then I ended up winning the competition. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was the biggest change. That was the first, okay, wow, I'm really in this industry and this is like really going to change my life. Um. So after I became a radio announcer, that was, it was an amazing few years. I, I, because it was a, a bit of a smaller station, I was able to do so much. I just delved into announcing, news reporting, um, whether it was, you know, like learning how to log the music. I just wanted to know everything about radio. So I really delved into it. And then I weirdly took a, another, like if, if we we're in a T-section, it was a complete 360 and I didn't even go left or right. I went completely back. I um, became a weather presenter like a weather chick. <laughs> and this was, again, with a lot of my opportunities, it's I just meet people, I make sure I make a really good impression, always keep them as a contact and just always keep my options open. And this kind of fell into my lap and I took the opportunity and then spent a few years becoming a weather presenter. Anyway, fast forward, moved through TV, radio here and there and obviously did a lot of personal things. I did a lot of traveling, this pre-COVID, obviously. You know, I hit some amazing um, travel milestones. Like I, you know, trekked to base camp Everest for my honeymoon after I got married. All this really, really, really fun stuff. And then kind of, I would say, um, COVID hit, <laughs> which changed the world completely, as we all know. And things kind of started to settle down for me a little bit. And I started to think about having kids because I had been married for two years at that point. And I thought, you know, I've always wanted to be a young mum. I really quite liked seeing my sister with her children. She had her first when she was 26. At the time I was 27. And I thought I've, I've always wanted to be a young mum, to really enjoy them, have the energy um, and also be able to, you know, be there at their 21st and not worry about meeting their grand, my grandchildren, that sort of thing. So um, because things slowed down, to be honest, I had a kid because we were in lockdown. I thought this is the perfect time. I'm not going to miss out on going out to drink because I'm pregnant. I'm not going to miss out on going clubbing with my friends because I'm pregnant. Nobody is. So I just honestly did it because it was great timing. This is actually a COVID baby. Yeah, it is. It is definitely a lockdown love baby. I will. I will confirm that. 
Noah, when you're like 16 and listening to this episode, <laughs> I hope you enjoy this. <laughs> Please don't cringe. But seriously, you were. It's hilarious. So as you said, you're a mum and you're a fantastic mum. I will put a link to her um, Instagram, guys. You've got to watch it. She's hilarious. Um, and I would love to talk about your journey so far with motherhood. It's just I'm yet to be a mum, but like you give birth and then there's like a human, right, mm. forever, and that human just doesn't go away. Like how are you? How are you <laughs> feeling? Um, and can you fill us in on that first six-month bubble of being a mum and what goes on, not just like physically but mentally? Oh, so much, Helen. Jeez, so, so so, 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 so much. But, you know, Noah is seven months old now, so I can definitely speak on those six months because I'm out of the bubble and things are, I want to preface this by saying things are so much better. And I remember people when I first had Noah, everybody would say to me, Nikki, like things get so much better. You get into the groove of things. He settles down. And I used to think all of you are lying to me. I am never, ever, ever going to get out of this hellhole that I've found myself in. Now, to explain what the hellhole was is um, when I was pregnant, I want to I start with when I was pregnant because I think it's really important to, um, to point this out because it did shape what I thought motherhood would be like and I think it kind of like fogged my vision of what was coming. So when I was pregnant, I was working. I worked right up until I nearly gave birth um, and I was really kicking some great career goals. I, um, As an example, I watched myself on TV the night before I gave birth doing my first story for Getaway, which was a show that I just, like in my wildest dreams, I never would have been given that opportunity. And the night before I gave birth, I ticked that box. So I was just on a high. <laughs> I was... Kicking goals career-wise, I was feeling really good as well. I think that's important to point out. You know, obviously everyone has a, a different type of pregnancy experience. Mine, luckily, was really, really positive. I didn't feel sick. I didn't, like, even crave weird things. I just had a pretty normal, like, consistent pregnancy. And thank God I had no complications, which was obviously very lucky. So then after, and then going into birth, birth itself is pff, whole you know, different thing. It's it's a crazy experience. Um, and yeah, it's painful and yeah, contractions are messed up and all that sort of stuff. But in saying that, I again had a really positive experience. You know, nothing went wrong. Noah was happy. He was healthy. I made it through. I got my epidural. There was no issues with that. So I was really, really happy and positive. So imagine, you know, you've gone through an amazing pregnancy, you've gone through an amazing birth, and then you're hit with motherhood. So it's even more of a, it's just, it's like, you, you know, you've been on this Ferris wheel enjoying yourself, and then a truck just hits you as soon as you walk off. So I think the contrast there really, really impacted my feelings as well, and my initial thoughts of motherhood. So you know, talking about bringing home, bringing Noah home from the from the hospital, everyone's absolutely, you know, terrified when you give birth to a baby and you think, oh my gosh, you're letting me leave these doors with this human and you're not going to help me anymore. But um, I think it doesn't really hit you the, I don't want to say seriousness of the situation. It is serious having a human to look after, but more the intensity of the situation until you really go home and start to get into the groove of things, you know. The baby starts crying and you start figuring out, you know, what do I need to do? You're feeding it. It's not sleeping. You're feeding it. It's crying. You're trying to feed it. It doesn't want to eat. You know, it's all, all these sort of things start to hit you. And I think the biggest thing for me was is I thought, what am I doing wrong? I constantly had this thought of I am failing because he's crying. I'm failing because he's not sleeping. I'm failing because you know, I am exhausted and I feel like I'm getting nothing right. And that's what it feels like, you know, because in those early days you have a newborn and this baby is trying to figure out its own life, let alone you're trying to figure out your new life. Yeah. Add on top of that, you know, you're recovering from giving birth. You, um, for me as well, I couldn't even see my family at the time because of COVID. So I've got these stresses of not even being able to, to have my mum over to meet him, you know, small things like that. And, and that really, really started to impact how I was feeling mentally. And 
Helen, you know me, you've met me. I'm a really always positive, pretty confident person. So that was another thing. I just was so drained of not knowing what to do and what to do right and like getting things wrong. When I say wrong, you know, that's in in quotation marks, commas, because there's nothing wrong when you're a mum, but you realise that later. Um, and I just was an absolute mess of emotions that I could not control. And um, it just, yeah, honestly, motherhood for me hit me like an absolute bus and I, I really, really struggled. For those first three months, I, I had a lot of postnatal blues, postnatal depression, and it was very, very intense. Wow. How did you get through the first five weeks, the first six weeks, the first seven weeks? How did you just keep pushing through? So I think it's, I mean, exa- it's exactly like you said. One thing I did and some, something that somebody recommended to me was just take it week by week. And every time I got to, Noel was born on a Saturday, so every time I got to a Saturday, it was as if I had just, okay, Nikki, one week is gone, another week is gone, another week is gone, you've ticked it off. And that's what I really did. I tried to start pacing myself and I tried to start just taking every day as it came and try. And it literally got to the point where it was like every hour as it came. Okay, I know that in this hour I should feed him, maybe put him down for a sleep, whatever it may be, and that hour was done. Now, we'll say I had a lot of help around me. So number one, was I had my partner and he was at home. And I was lucky enough that he was at home for six weeks once the baby was born, which is really, really rare. And I completely appreciate that people out there do not, are not, aren't in the financial position to have that available, to have their partner take that much time off work and help out at home. So that was one thing that really, really kept me going. I think the other thing was um, I had my sister and my mum who were my absolute rock I would call my sister I reckon in those early days eight times a day what what the f is going on Anna what is this do I put him in this why is he still crying and she being a mum herself she was in this bubble and I want to explain the mum and parent bubble it's not really a mum bubble it's a parent bubble you becoming a parent is like hmm do you know when somebody tells you oh, my gosh, I had the best cake ever the other day. It was so delicious. You don't understand. When I tell you that, in your mouth, you like semi kind of taste that cake. You think about it and you're like, oh, that would taste delicious. But until you have a bite of that cake, you will never know what it tastes like. You'll never truly know what it tastes like. And that's what parenthood is. I used to see people all around me have kids, my sister, my friends, and I thought, when I became a parent, I thought, why didn't I know how intense this was? Why didn't I realise how hard this was? It's because you just will never understand until you're in that group. But all you can do is just try and prepare yourself as best you can and understand that you need to set your expectations really low, (laughs) really, really low. Call on people that are a parent because only they will understand Friends, family, colleagues, whoever you know who is a parent, those are the people who will understand. So when you're going through those tough times, those are the people that you need to reach out to. What about your physical body? What happened after you gave birth (laughs) until six months? So physical, you know, again, I like I was pretty lucky in the recovery. I had a natural birth. I did take an epidural. I was all for any like you know, within the first hour of my contraction, I was like, what have we got on the table, guys? Could I take, like, are we looking at Panadol even? Like, you know, just just give me what's available right now. Um, so I had great pain management throughout it. And then following the birth, yeah, I had I had a pretty good recovery. You know, you're, you're definitely sore. You know, you, I don't want to be too visual, but you're still figuring out how to pee. You're still figuring out how to go to the toilet. So for, I would say, like four to six weeks after, it's a lot of that physical pain and tiredness as well. So add to that, you know, you've got this mental challenge. You've got um, literally physically a baby crying, screaming, not crying and not sleep, 
not, sorry, not sleeping and you're not sleeping. So it's all this added um, pressure on both your mind and on your body. It's like you need to have some sort of a recovery plan in place before you like give birth and you're like, okay, how am I going to take care of myself when I don't have sleep for a whole day? And when I am in so much pain and when my baby is being a little nightmare. Oh, you need, you need, I think, yeah, you do need to speak about it. I know now I I didn't do anything and this is probably what contributed to the intensity of it all. But I say to all my friends now who are pregnant, I give them all these practical tips. Number one is um, if you, if your mum offers, let her move in. Just accept the help. Whoever can help you, if, if your mum wants to come over and do a night shift, great. If your sister wants to do that, if a friend of yours offers, honestly take the help when you can. I think the other thing is as well, like even just think about anything that you can do to prepare for that craziness of the newborn phase. So things like um, if you can cook up some meals and freeze them and have them in your, fr- and your freezer ready to go so that you know, whenever you're eating dinner, 11 p.m. at night that day, you can just chuck something in and it's ready to go. And also I think, you know, small practical things. If you have a pet, for example, take them to your to whoever will mind them for a couple of weeks just so that that's one less thing on your mind that you have to worry about. It's a bit of less guilt because the pet will always be neglected in those first few weeks. Just small things that can really help um, ease your mind wherever you can get a bit of ease from. Those are some great tips. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Pre-prepare some meals or maybe ask friends to help you with meals in the first Mm. few weeks of birth. And if you have extra responsibilities like a pet, have that sorted. Wow, before birth. That is such valuable advice. Thank you for that. But, Nikki, it's time for your first curveball. Are you ready to play? I'm excited. I'm nervous. (laughs) You can't be when you're a mum. <laughs> Just got to delve in. Just got to. <laughs> what is one thing that most people don't know about you? I am obsessed. Obsessed isn't even the right word to use, but with olives. Like I, as an example, when I was 10, I had so many olives that I needed to go to hospital because my stomach had too much acid in it. Like that's literally how obsessed I am with olives. Addiction. Mm. That is an addiction. That is so interesting. I think my goddaughter has that addiction too. She'll have olives for breakfast. She'll, if we're at dinner and there's olives, she will demolish at least 20 of those. Oh, delicious. And if you don't like them, you're not human. There's something <laughs> There's something going on and you need to sort it out, honestly. <laughs> Nikki, postnatal depression and postnatal depletion is very real and sometimes people have postnatal depletion thinking it's depression and there's a whole bunch of new information coming out on this but how I think you sort of answered it how did you prepare for that did you prepare for that did you even think that this could even happen to you and when you experienced baby blues what were the symptoms that you may have missed like now you can probably look back and think oh that was a symptom and did you know what was going on when you experienced any of those symptoms so yeah postnatal depression it's something that you hear about and you might have like read something about it or you might have heard a friend of a friend who's had it and I was very much like that but I'd never dealt with it personally I'd never had somebody close to me deal with it so I didn't know much about it which was a reason why I thought, wow, this is really taking over and I have no idea about it. I think the number one thing to notice about post, let's just even talk about baby blues. I think I would say the majority of women, once they have a baby, honestly, they feel those baby blues and it's nothing to do. I really want to reiterate. It's nothing to do with you and there's nothing wrong with it. What it is, is just your life has changed so drastically that you're just so scared of the change and scared of the fact that you can't go back to your previous life that, you know, you probably enjoyed and had more time to yourself, that you are just so terrified that these feelings of sadness, exhaustion, um, you know, just 
pure guilt for feeling, you know, any sort of resentment towards your situation, you feel as if you're feeling those towards your baby, but you're not. You're just upset about the entire situation. So I think that's really, really thing to one thing to remember when you're in the midst of these baby blues. Now, the thing that I would point out with me is I went from being a really, really bubbly person to all of a sudden being sad all the time. My main symptom was just sadness. I was sad about the fact that I was tired. I was sad about the fact that I had a baby that I honestly like couldn't just take out of the house and give to somebody else. Like that's the point at which I got. I was sad that I felt my old life was completely gone. So I think that's number one thing is sadness and a change in your personality. Now, when you have to really look at it as, okay, there's something really wrong here and I need to maybe get some help, is when that sadness isn't going away with time. So if you feel sad for a couple of weeks and then things start to ease up and you feel much more like yourself and things are fine and you're speaking to your friends and you're feeling much bubblier, that's great and that's amazing and that's probably what happens to a lot of women. But I think once the sadness doesn't go away or it becomes a cycle of sadness and a cycle of resentment so you're happy one day and then another day you're back into the pit of sadness or you're highly anxious one day and then the next day you're really really happy but go back to that anxiety that's when it's become a bit of a cycle and I think that that's when you really need to reach out for some professional help. Did you experience that cycle? Yeah, so that's when I knew that I definitely didn't just have some baby blues. I had some proper feelings that I needed to deal with within myself so that I could move on, I could become a a better mum and I could become a better person for Noah. So for me, the penny dropped when I I would always run to my sister whenever I felt anxious or sad. Again, I always, I've always i said before, my sister was always my support system. And I remember this was week eight probably, so Noel was two months old. So it's two months of heavy, you know, feelings and emotions. And my sister said, Nikki, you can talk to me anytime. Anytime you can come and talk to me and cry. You know, I was crying all the time, which is totally normal when you have a baby, by the way. Um, <laughs> but she said, but what I'm finding is, that I can only give you so much. I'm your sister and your friend and I can give you as much as vi- advice that I can. So even though I would go two, three days of being, okay, great, happy, confident, oh, he's so cute, he smiled, there would be another day where it would all come crashing down and my emotions would hide it. I'd be highly anxious, I'd be sad again, I'd be thinking about, you know, what my past life was like. So that was, for me, an indicator that I went to go, I need to go see professional help and I did. And I reached out to an organization called panda.org.au, which is a free counseling line for postnatal depression and anxiety. Um, And I just spoke to somebody. I picked up the phone and I spoke to a professional. Good on you for not having shame. I think that's a lot. I think Um, it's really important. What about about your husband? (laughs) Just. Where was he? So, like. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this person has to sort of like witness a lot of what's going on they sort of witness the whole change in you uh, and they might be freaking out like what am I supposed to do here what did he do what should he have done <laughs> or what would you have preferred that he would have done <laughs> so I think well number one is as well to point out that um you know, guys can also go through postnatal depression. It's just a different form of it because for them, things have changed as well. Yeah, they they haven't given birth and they're not in that physical state, but they can also obviously be experiencing exhaustion, a change in their, um, you know, their emotions and their behaviour and their routine. So I think that's important to, to point out. Now, my husband was really, really great throughout the entire situation. So he, out of everyone obviously knows me best. So he could clearly see that there was a change in my personality. So the thing that he did that really, really helped me out is number one was just at the start of every day, you know, just like motivation. It was just purely like, let's try this. He was always on board with trying something new, helping out. Literally, if I was like, 
he's not eating, I need a new bottle, he would go out and buy it. And five minutes later, he would be back. So just supporting any decision I was making to try and, you know, get Noah to sleep or get him to feed, he was always there. He was always there with ideas and also just that motivation and that positivity. I think it's important for that partner to be positive no matter how dire the situation is and how sad you might be at home. Um, I think I would say is... um, for example, just physically being there, as I've mentioned, it's really, really handy if your partner can take as much time off as they can. And I want to point out as well, if you live, for example, in Australia, there's a lot of financial assistance to be able to do that. There's things like dad and partner pay that you can be paid to stay at home if, if, for example, your employer doesn't do that. So just look into those options ahead of time to make sure that you're maximizing the amount of time that you have that partner help. I'd probably say if you are a soon-to-be dad and you're listening to this, I would um, I would be on the same page because I felt like I was reading so much information all the time about sleeping patterns, routines, blah, blah, blah. And I felt like I always had to explain the plan and, and the approach to my partner and it would have just been easier if they were reading the same thing as me. So maybe just be a little bit more interested. Hey, do you want me to read this particular routine? Do you want me to get on board with this information? Hey, do you want to send me that article? I'll read it as well so that we're all on the same page. So good, be on the same page, have a positive outlook, especially if the mother of the baby is having a hard time. Try to be as supportive as possible and Try to carry some of the load by being physically present in the whole experience. But there's some really great tips. That's amazing. Anything we missed out? (laughs) Because I know there's men listening that might be becoming new dads. There's no handbook. (laughs) There is no handbook, honestly, but you just like at least wing it together, you know, Be, be in it together. And you know what? Have a laugh at the end of the day. Crack a joke crack a bottle of wine if you can um, and just like take those little moments when you can to just take a breath together and relax a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Nikki, it's time for your second curveball. Are you ready to play? I'm ready. What's your favourite form of self-care? Self-care, God, I do not do much of that these these days, I will say. Um, do you know what? I'm, a, I'm really big on a good skincare routine. And honestly, if I have ticked off a cleanse, an exfoliant and a moisturizer at the end of the day, that is all I need to feel fresh, vibrant as and as if I've just been to like a facial. That's all I want. And it takes like three minutes. Yep. That's all you got to do and you feel good. So good. I remember when my sister-in-law had her first child, I sometimes would say that when I was there, do you want to go have a shower? And she was oh. like, yes. <laughs> the excitement of having a shower when you are the mum of a newborn, my God, I could I could have been in that shower for like 30 minutes and just drowned out the, the world, but I eventually came out. <laughs> I was like, that was the best shower. <laughs> she got to take her time. But, yeah, and that's part of the, the thing. Like as a friend or, you know, a support person, Think about what this person is going through because back in our ancestral times, there used to be like a village that would help out the mother, whereas here it's like some mothers have four weeks, some don't even have that and they have to go back to work. And there is support that is needed and is so helpful for people. Just the tiniest thing, drop over food for the day for your friend um go in look after the baby for a bit and let them have a shower hire a cleaner for them as a surprise just stuff like that i love. Oh, I like that one yeah. <laughs> i like the cleaner that is a good idea yeah because that's just one thing you don't really want to do when you've got a newborn clean your bloody house very low on the priority list as well yeah. and don't feel bad about it i think that's another thing we as a mum, you feel so guilty. Like I haven't cooked anything for weeks. I haven't cleaned it. You're looking at a pile of trash that hasn't been taken out. Who cares? You literally have a human to raise. Just focus on that. How long do you reckon you should just focus on that? Like that whole first little bubble where it's like, 
I don't know what I'm doing. Why is the poo black? Why is she getting a rash now that I've given her something new? Like, when? <laughs> <laughs> the rash. Yes. Like, yeah, because so, my niece had a rash after we gave her banana and egg. And we're like, ah, she's got to, what's going on? Quick. And then. Uh, the, the rash panic, yeah, that hits me like every three days. I'm like, what is that dot on his stomach? I'm a very big Google doctor, which is something you shouldn't do as a um, as a mum as well. But I think, um, I mean, never set a crazy expectation on yourself. You know, already as society, we need to bounce back in terms of physically. You shouldn't have a tummy after two months apparently these days. You know, there's so many things that you're not meant to do. You shouldn't ask for help because you should know you're a mum. Figure it out yourself. What? Nobody knows. So I think don't set an expectation for yourself. But I think maybe not an expectation, but a goal. So what I would say is maybe after three months, because that's what they call the fourth trimester, is your one to three months, the baby's out of the newborn stage, they're looking a little bit more normal, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're smiling a little bit, they're giving you a little bit more than just poo and crying. So I think the three-month mark is a good time to kind of reset and maybe like feel confident enough as well to go out with your friends, leave the baby for a little bit with your partner, with your mum, whoever it may be, and take some time to yourself. It's always going to be baby steps, I will say, because there's so much anxiety around doing things for the first time, whether it's leaving them for the first time, giving them a bottle for the first time, letting them cry it out for the first time because you want them to sleep. But it's all, all about baby steps. These are some powerful <laughs> bits of information. <laughs> Why do you believe that big shifts happen in some women and not in others, because that's not fair. And also, is there a time where you believe that professional help should be sought or what sort of help should you look for? Like if you need support, like I, I know you mentioned Panda, but is that the only source of like support for women? Like do, do you speak to a psychologist or what? Go, tell us what to do. So this is another thing is that you just you don't know what comes after birth and the yes. support that comes after birth. I think you are so supported up until you give birth. You have midwife appointments, OB appointments. By the end of it, you're going in weekly. Somebody is telling you about, you know, epidural, cesarean, this and that. You are so well informed. And then you give birth and it's kind of like, whoa, where did everybody go? So I think that's probably more of an issue with our system but also something that you need to be prepared for as well. So I think number one is take up all the help you can get post-birth. So things like, for example, um, once you're in the hospital, go to all the classes. Go to the bathing class, know how to bathe your baby. Go to the breastfeeding class. That's something that I skipped out on that I really, really regret because I thought oh, I'll just figure it out at home. Did not figure it out. It was bad. <laughs> Just on that, I remember I was with my other friend and she was trying to breastfeed and baby wasn't latching and she just looked at me. She was like, I don't know what to do. And I was like, I'll help you. Can I touch your boob? <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah. I mean, and that's a whole other part of motherhood as well. If you choose to breastfeed, which 100% do what you would like to do, do not let anybody shame you for it. I breastfed for eight weeks wasn't for me. I had issues and I moved on to formula. I had so much guilt at the time, but I thought, why am I feeling guilty? This is, this is the best decision for me and my baby. I do not care what people think. So I think just be as informed as you can be and use those services at the hospital. After the hospital, a lot of people don't know, but your midwife does check up on you. So have that conversation with her in the first meeting and she will give you as much resources as she can. I know I was having breastfeeding issues at the time, so she put me in touch with a lactation consultant who was at the hospital free of charge. It was all under the public health system. So things like that were really, really helpful. And I've actually wanted to share a few other um, really helpful organisations that, that I literally called these helplines like four times a day. There's And these are all, again, free of charge. It's somebody to talk to and somebody that has the expertise that you can call on during a time that, again, you are just figuring shit out. Like, what is that and why does it look like that? So number one, I called the Australian Breastfeeding Association. If you Google them, they have a free line that is just amazing. You call the line at any time of the day, 24 hours a day, and a volunteer will answer the phone and try and help you with the situation. I was asking things like, 
how long is he meant to be feeding? Because at the moment he's only feeding for five minutes. And I was asking things like, what different positions can I use? Because when I'm holding him like a cradle hold, it is hurting my nipple. And it was just so useful. Again, free of charge, amazing resource. Panda is one for obviously your, your mental state. Make sure you, you can even just, even if you're feeling a little bit sad, talk to somebody that gets it, that understands it and can give you some practical tips on, okay, I wake up every morning and I'm highly anxious about whether he's sleeping, whether he's breathing, what's going to happen during the day. And they can give you some tips, write down your thoughts. I know one of the one of the people that I called was like, make sure that when you wake up in the night, you have a notepad next to you on your bedside table and anything that you're thinking about for the next day, for example, you write it down. So I was writing things like try this different teeth size and um, maybe try another layer when he's sleeping because maybe he's cold. Just things that I thought, okay, I'm not going to forget that because I've written it down and now I can go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. So that was really, really practical help. And the other service that I called on quite a lot was called Caratane. And if you just search that, Caratane, on Google, they do things like anything, breastfeeding support, parenthood support, development support, feeding, anything. You can just call the line, ask, they'll patch you into somebody that knows about that and you can get a little bit of advice. So there, just remember anything that you're struggling with, Google it and there's probably a service for it. Thank you so much for that. I'll put a link to all of those in the show notes, guys, because there is help after you give birth, which is really reassuring because I feel like a lot of people don't know about that yeah and you don't and I I I figured it out on the way and that was hard enough yeah so important (sighs) Nikki it's time for your last curveball are you ready to play all right hit me I think I've done pretty well till now I'm not gonna lie I think (laughs) I've done pretty well (laughs) what was your last random act of kindness Well, I don't know if it was a random act of kindness, but I've just started a new role as a writer for Essential Baby and Essential Kids. And I'm actually writing a piece on this amazing um, service that's called Diamond Women. And they offer support services for people who are dealing with an unplanned pregnancy. And I just think they're absolutely amazing in every sense. And because it's COVID, they unable to they are unable to hold any kind of like face-to-face meetings at the moment so they've turned those into zoom meetings they're continuing to support their clients it's a free service again we were talking about making sure that you know about these things and I really really wanted to get that out there to people because I think it's just so so amazing so I'm writing a piece on that in the hope that a lot of people will read it and maybe reach out to them and 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 get some help where can we get essential baby where can we read your stuff So essentialbaby.com.au and essentialkids.com.au. But you can follow along at my Instagram as well. It's Hey Nicolina K. And I'll link all my articles up on there and and share my day-to-day craziness of being a (laughs) mum. Because I know someone that's pregnant and it wasn't planned. Actually, she didn't even know she was pregnant. Wow. (laughs) See, those stories blow my mind. Blow my mind. Very, very often you hear of those. About that lady, um... That was in the aeroplane and she gave birth. No. She didn't even know she was pregnant. Thank and there was wow. four doctors. Three of them were NICU ward ladies because it was a premature baby and there was another doctor. Oh, if that's not luck, I don't know what is. I'm gonna it was meant to be. <laughs> it was super like worldwide news. Just one more question. I can hear your baby crying. I know. God, this always happens to me. See, this is, this is the reality of being a mum. <laughs> He's always there, guys, always there. (laughs) Imagine reliving your whole birth experience, okay? What advice would you give to yourself? And can you give us a list of your top tips when it comes to that and the baby bubble? My birth experience, I would say I pre-birth didn't do any birthing classes so I didn't you know go to your typical um you know you see in the movies when you're sitting like your partner's cradling you with his feet and you're practicing pushing or whatever it was I'm a very I don't want to know what can go wrong I just want to go in I know that I'm in the best care in the world we have an amazing public health system and so I didn't do that 
I actually found that really, really helpful because, again, I didn't go into my birth being very, very anxious about anything or thinking about what could go wrong. I just went in and went with the flow, and I think that would, that made it a really, really positive experience. In terms of my top lists coming to the baby bo- bubble, I did want to share a few here. So number one I would say is there's two books I want to recommend that have been really, really insightful for me is number one is Not So Mumsy by Marsha Leone. And it's just a really great book to read before you give birth. And it just reminds you that you are still who you are. You're a mum, but you're also still yourself. Your personality will still be there. You as a person will still be there and you will get back to the life that you knew, knew and loved. And the other one is The Motherhood by Jamila Risby, Risby, which is um, a compilation of letters from different journalists and celebrities that write a letter to themselves while they were in the newborn bubble and what they wish they would have told themselves at the time. And it's really insightful. If you buy that one, I recommend, recommend you buy it and you leave it and you read it during that first, that fourth trimester, because that's when you really, really need to hear those words. So those are my two book recommendations. And the other thing I just want to say is go to your mother's group. You get allocated a mother's group in your local government area once you give birth. And I think it's really important in the pits of in the pits of what you're experiencing at the time and as scared as you are to get a bag, put your baby in the car and leave the house, just do it because you will not regret it and you'll meet some really, really fabulous people. So insightful. Thank you so much. I think I'm ready now to have a baby. Oh, don't say that. <laughs> do not say that. If I have come out of this convincing anyone to have a child, I apologise. <laughs> And do not come back and, you know, speak. Do not come and message me on Instagram and be like, how dare you? What have you done to me? No, children are a blessing and they are amazing. And I absolutely adore Noah, but it is hard. Um, But as hard as it is, as it is, it is so worth it. Yeah, I agree. So, guys, go and like her and love her on Instagram. She's actually quite hilarious. I don't know if you know, but I just <laughs> wait for your stories. And I love that she is very real and raw on Instagram so when she was you know having a bit of her baby blue bout I reached out and I was just like Nikki I love you you're doing everything right (laughs) take it day by day no two days are the same when you have a child and I think that's impossible Um, so well done you you're an inspiration to a lot of mothers and mothers to be and thank you for sharing so openly today Thanks, Helen. It's been such a pleasure. I've had such such a good time. And, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the support and the love. And I'll talk to you soon. Can I just quickly ask, how's your fitness? No, oh, do not ask a <laughs> mother that. No, you know what? My fitness has actually been okay. I kind of picked that up, like, what, four to five months after having Noah when I felt like I was ready. And I just started to eat a little bit better and do a little bit of exercise at home. Obviously, COVID lockdown, I couldn't go to the gym. Um, But that's important too. And I've made sure I've made some time for that. Good on you. (laughs) All right, girl, I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Holy dooly. What an episode full of amazingness. I love that she pointed out that a change in your personality for a long period of time at the start of the baby bubble, you know, the first three months is something to really watch out for just to make sure that you're not covering up any deeper issues that you may be having where it might be something like postnatal depletion where you're depleted of minerals or depression where you, you just need some strategies to help you cope and understand that you're not alone in this and it is okay to feel however you feel. And I love that we learned what the men can do to help support this whole time because sometimes the guys feel a little bit helpless with what they can do or what they should do or what their role is in this whole experience. I hope you liked this episode, guys, uh, especially those of you that are mums or mum to bees or people just even considering having a child. It is a bit of a roller coaster. So one thing that I took away from this is try not to have too higher expectations so that you're not feeling so much disappointment and just sit on the roller coaster 
and enjoy the ride. And if you vomit, you vomit. (laughs) If you know anyone that has just had a baby or is about to conceive, please share this episode with them because it might just be their saving grace. I got a lot of insight into parenthood and how life can change. And I hope that you also got some valuable insight from this episode. I'd love to hear what you liked about this episode on my Instagram post. Thank you times infinity for spending time with me. It really means a lot. Putting yourself first will really help escalate your goals, your dreams, and I love being on the journey with you. So make sure you come and tell me on my Instagram at whole health which is h-o-l underscore health and comment below this podcast photo to share your thoughts on my show today and if you enjoyed it please leave me a five-star review on itunes or spotify so that i can keep bringing amazing value to you i'm sending you truckloads of love power and joy bye for now